ka tini wiki o te waitangi hiki tini te mihi atu kia koutou. E te atua ka harawa anei mātou e whakapetai kia koe hirungi te ngoto mātou kai whakaora, whakatongi a tō wairu a tatu, hei arahi, hei tohu tohu kia mātou, kia te tuki i ngā moe moe a mai te rangi ki te whenua. Ko koe tau mātou te ringa, ko koe tau mātou toka tū ngā moana, anei mātou e whakapetai hirungi te ngoto mātou kai whakaora, mā ake ake, āmen. Tēnā koutou. short reading from the book of Isaiah that we had last uh, Sunday in uh, many churches reflects the experience of the people of Israel in hard times but looking to God for uh, strength and focus and um, better future to whom then will you liken me or make me equal says the Holy One lift up your eyes and see who has created all this? He has ordered them as a starry host and called them each by name. So mighty is his power, so great his strength, that not one of them is missing. How can you say, O Jacob, how can you complain, O Israel, that your destiny is hidden from me, that your rights are ignored by Yahweh? Have you not known, have you not heard, that Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. His knowledge is without limit. He gives strength to the enfeebled. He gives vigor to the wearied. Youth may grow tired and faint. Young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in Yahweh will renew their strength. They will soar as with eagles' wings. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and never tire. Welcome, everybody, um, to a new year and to this first uh, council meeting for the year. So it's Thursday the 8th of February 2018. It's 9.37 a.m. and we'll open this uh, Hamilton City Council full council meeting. Uh, so we'll start with apologies. Okay. So there are no apologies. If, do we have uh, then a confirmation of agenda? I'll pass this over to uh, Democracy Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor Andrew. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, in confirming the agenda today, please note that Mayor Andrew asked that for debate at two minutes, with an extension of one minute if required, that the meeting will break at 1.15 uh, until approximately 3.15 to allow all elected members to attend the Waikato Business Summit, and noting that there are some additions to the Chair's report which were communicated to elected members uh, last evening. Thank you. Okay, do we have a mover? Uh, James, seconded by Gary. Um, all those for, any against, carried. Uh, declarations of interest, public forum. Uh, Sorry, uh, yes. Item 11. Item 11. Yeah. The recommended lease here is well known to me, so I won't be taking part in that debate. Very good. Thank you. You can stay at the table, just push away from the table a bit, that'll be fine. Or you can leave the room, whatever your, your choice. Um, okay, um, public forum. No, no public forum. Uh, confirmation of council minutes. Uh, I'll just uh, hand over to democracy manager again. Uh, so this is a 6th of December 2017, 10-year plan. Thank you. Uh, elected members, uh, we noted, government sent you an email noting an error on page 39 uh, and 40 regarding uh, 
Councillor Tuman being recorded uh, twice. So we sent you an email about that. Um, other councillors have brought some uh, other amendments to our attention, which I'd just like to go through, if I may. Um, so on page 39 to 40, uh, instead of Councillor Tuman being there twice, one should be Councillor Tuman, one should be Councillor Mallet. Um, on page nine, uh, there's a typographical error, so principal should of course be principal, as in principal of the school. Um, on page 25, there is a, another typographical error, so um, unfortunately Brian, Square name, Brian Square's name has been spelt incorrectly, so that has now been corrected. Um, on page 22, uh, the votes are recorded incompletely. Um, and councillors Pascoe, O'Leary and McPherson are missing and will be added. I'd also like to point out uh, that, and uh, Deputy Mayor Gallagher raised this with us this morning, we have um, added already an explanation to the online minutes explaining the revocation rules, i.e. the 75% majority required to pass, just so it's easy for the public to understand what happened with some of those motions that appeared to have a majority, uh, but failed at the 75% threshold. Uh, the minutes in front of you don't have that annotation, uh, but the online and the final versions uh, do. Is there anything else, elected members? And I apologise, it's just come into my head, so with the leave of the meeting and your leave, I was wondering, in terms of page 13, as you know, and of course I'm joined oh, to the sorry, page, page 13, as you know, I am joined to the Mayor at the hip, but I um, did make the point with all my seconding during the 10-year plan that I was doing that in my capacity as Deputy Mayor uh, and that my vote would be individual on each point. So it was a form, in other words, I was, so I just wondered if that could be a note that was out. Just as the Mayor made a statement, you know, because these are descriptive minutes, but I was quite clear that when I seconded all the motions, I was doing that to facilitate uh, debate as Deputy Mayor. Councillor Gallagher's vote was a separate issue. Uh, typically, Deputy Mayor, we would only include um, a comment if it were framed as a personal explanation at the time, if uh, Mayor Which Andrews I did do. and elected members understood that that was yeah. the standing mm -hmm. order you were invoking to do so, then yes, and we can annotate the minutes in that point. Sorry to interrupt you, but the transcript will clearly record that I said that at the time. So I, oh, I, I leave understand it what you said, yeah. Deputy Mayor. I'm, not, I'm just pointing sure. out that we didn't go through standing order at the no. time to do it, but I'm happy, um, given that the understanding was that was your intention, that we will update the yeah. minutes as you request. And I'll leave the form to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies for my, it no? just occurred to me. Is there anything else, elected members? Just on page 35. Yes. On the Gallagher Performing Arts Centre, I noticed that uh, I voted against that motion, but I'm not recorded as doing so. 37 still. So. Okay, well, thank you. Noted. <laughs> no, oh, no, it's important to have it right. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, do we have a mover? Uh, Thank you, Councillor Gary, seconder. Seconder. Can Councillor Jeff. Uh. <laughs> All those for, any against? Yep. Carried. Um, me, Andrew. I thought I was missing from a vote. Did you pick that up? Yes, I covered that. Sorry, I'm working electronically now, so I'm yeah. trying to catch up. No, you so did. Covered. So all the uh, amendments that I described, yeah. uh, the vote is subject to those, and they will be annotated clearly in the minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'm still against. Thanks. Is there something that's inaccurate? Only, only my experience. Um, I, I believe I've uh, raised it with the governance manager and with um, Becca. Uh, I made a mistake and I don't have the luxury like the Deputy Mayor of putting a caveat before a vote. Um, the outcome is the same but it's not, it wasn't my experience at the time. So it's not, it, it, it's not material. So what we're voting on uh, is the accuracy of the minutes? No, no, it's not an accuracy of the minutes but I, I'm just against the minutes. 
it's easier for me to... I've, I've spoken yeah. to the governance manager, taken her advice. Yes. Although, was, sorry, if I, if I may, um, the, the purpose of this motion is to attest I, to the accuracy of the minutes. I understand that. And, but I, and, and I also yeah. understand that what you're saying is yeah. that you're understanding at the time... Uh, was different. Yeah. Uh, person, can I, if, if I may suggest administratively, it would be easier to note for the record, given that we've um, allowed f for the records to be noted as accurate, and Councillor O'Leary's point heard, then potentially her voting against the accuracy of the 10 year plan minutes. Yes. It's entirely the same view. I won't re-articulate it. So, just to be clear, what we're voting on is the accuracy no, I, of the minutes. I am a hundred percent clear on what we are voting on. Yeah. So you're voting against the accuracy of the minutes. Well, I'm entitled to do that, but yeah, um, just just making sure I, that we're all on the same page. The other. So, Paula, are you doing the same? Um, I, I was open to advice about how that that misunderstanding got rectified because I was also surprised when I came across that. Oh, yeah, so something procedurally went awry at that moment. How do we deal with it at this moment is the question. I'll hand this over to the democracy manager. Um, taking, keeping in mind that what this motion is about is accuracy of the minutes. Okay. Um, I don't share the view that necessarily that something procedurally and correct happen. I support uh, and I appreciate and understand that some elected members, when we're coming up to the revocation and the alteration motions, uh, were not entirely clear about the, the framing of the motion. So it was kind of negatively framed <coughs> rather than a positively framed motion and that caused confusion for some elected members. Uh, the conversation I had with Councillor Leary, she understands that that wouldn't have changed the outcome, but necessarily she feels that her vote was incorrectly recorded based on her understanding of the motion at the time. That's the issue in a, in a nutshell. So the uh, record of the meeting is correct in terms of the procedural understanding, but in terms of the the framing of the matter at the time, um, Councillor O'Leary and I understand Councillor Pest, uh, Councillor Southgate also, and Councillor Henry, uh, similarly feel that the, the negatively framed motion, because it was revocation, uh, was confusing. Okay, so we'll go back to the vote on this one. So we're voting on the accuracy of the minutes of the 10-year plan meeting, which are in front of us. Okay, so. Not on this particular matter that we've been discussing, but my understanding from the democracy manager is on page 22, where my name, um, Councillor McPherson and O'Leary are not recorded. We are voting now on the accuracy as to how they voted with not knowing how they actually voted. So I'm just a little bit in doubt as to whether we can um, vote on that accuracy when, the, when, the, when myself and the two other councillors' votes are not known or not recorded. Democracy manager. Um, I'm, so my team checked this morning and I'm advised that the three uh, missing votes, councillors Pascoe, O'Leary and McPherson voted for the amendment. So, okay, so that's, that's the correction. And that now. is the correction okay, um, okay. That, that will be made. Okay, I wasn't sure you actually said that earlier on. You said that that still yeah. had to be Possibly included. I didn't say it yeah. as clearly okay. as I should have, Councillor Pesson. I'm happy with yeah. the explanation. Okay, so we T missing off that mallet? Yes. I, I am sick and tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we had picked that up. I'm sorry, I should have read it out, Councillor Mellett, to make you feel affirmed. Can it not be? Um, can there not be a comment <laughs> in the minutes? That was my suggestion at the start of this conversation, Councillor South. Yeah, the comment made made it, if there was one sentence or properly worded that suggested that there had been that, then I'd be happy with that. 
Um, I'm happy to note the substance of this conversation for the minute. Yeah. So it would be formally recorded that the issue was raised, it was heard by the council, um, and it is in the official record of the meeting. So that would be in these, I, not these minutes, but today's minutes, you're saying? It would be in today's minutes. There's no reason why as part of that we cannot uh, retrospect. I don't think there's any reason why we can't annotate the minutes online. So it will be these minutes. These minutes, okay. once approved with the okay. amendments and the note, are the official final record that go online. Okay, so if that, if that um, is encapsulating, I'll happily vote for the minute correctness of the minutes. Thanks. I, I suspect that that is the best approach to cover off both the accuracy of the minutes mm -hmm. and, and note the concerns that you've raised. Okay, so we're voting on item five. Um, we have a mover and a seconder. All those for? Those against? We're now moving to item six on page 61. And we have a mover. So it's confirmation of council open minutes, 12th of December 2017, 10-year plan. Uh, moved by Councillor James, seconded by Councillor Mallett. All those for? Any against? Carried. Uh, item seven, confirmation of council open minutes on the 14th of December 2017. We have a mover. Councillor James, seconded by Councillor Mallett. Uh, all those for? Any against? Carried. Now we're moving to item eight, the chair's report on page 79. Um, now, I just want to note that there was a email distributed last night with some uh, uh, with a verbal update to be presented to this meeting. And um, before I start, I also want to particularly thank H3 and Sean and your team and your staff who worked so hard over the weekend to pull off what was a hugely successful first rugby sevens in Hamilton. Um, which is just absolutely fantastic for our city and the financial spin-off and the feel-good aspect that went with it for our city and the behaviour of the crowd was absolutely fantastic and the behaviour in our city afterwards on both nights was, was very, very good. So um, we just want to congratulate you and your team for all you did. It was a lot of, lot of work leading up and over the weekend that you did to pull us off in, in partnership with um, 37 South and um, we just, as the Mayor and I'm sure this Council would agree that um, you did a fine job in securing this and in executing it, so thank you very much. It's very difficult to measure, measure the good of it. Okay, so we'll take the chair's report as read. Um, the um, document I distributed last night for a verbal update now. Um, firstly, I just want to point out that under the Central City Park, that should read 22,200, um, not 22,000, next to uh, staff support, uh, next to the total. And... Um, so we might just we might start with the chair's report itself. So um, there's the ministerial meetings. Um, so we had a very good meeting at the end of last year with uh, Minister Twyford and um, Minister F Minister for Housing and Transport, as well as Minister Robinson, who's uh, the finance minister. Um, just want to say that this government is extremely cooperative and working very closely with this council and they have a really good attitude and there's a really good feel about um, these actually really high powered ministers who have a huge say in, in the direction of this country which reflects down onto this council and um, the working relationship has got off to a very, very good start and I don't expect that to change. Um, the minister did ask us to that he would like us to include 40% uh, of our special housing areas as um, in our SHAs as uh, qualifying for Kiwi Build. 
um, the next day um, we sent back a I sent back a letter to the minister saying that we would endeavour to do that at the sign off when we come to the sign off for us, which is then going through to counts uh, to government for the final sign off, and um, if that's their wish, I think that um, we should get behind them and and do everything we can to to deliver um, what they've asked us to. Um, as you know, I believe in working very closely with central government and working to achieve what they want for our city as well as what we want for our city. So um, I've also rung um, some of the main big players who've got applications in on SHAs and personally let them know about this and we sent off a letter on the same day informing them that we request um, that they fulfil this um, outcome, which I think is good for our city as well, um, to ensure that 40% of what they put up will qualify for, fee for Kiwi Build. Um, just loosely, my understanding of what Kiwi Build is is um, build, um, houses that qualify under a certain price um, would could be bought off the plans by central government and resold directly to first time home buyers, which takes the speculator out of the circuit. At the moment, what you've got is a lot of a huge amount of houses that have been sold in Hamilton. 80% of them have to be pre sold before they even go, before the banks will approve um, the start of the development, before they approve the finance. So the developer goes out and, and puts them on the market, and they're being picked up by um, speculators. Who are profiteering by between one and two hundred thousand dollars per section at times per house, finished house. By the time they get finished a year later, and and the government is trying part of what the Kiwi Builds about is taking that speculator out of the out of the loop, so the first time home buyer can buy it at the price that the developer is selling it for in the first place. So it's a very good initiative, and um, and we're. We're ha I'm happy to do what we can to ensure the government can can achieve that goal. Um, on the regional fuel tax, um, the government has said no. Um, they want to hold that for Auckland only. Um, I accept that. Um, obviously, I'm disappointed, and they've acknowledged that um, we would be disappointed with that, but um, they're quite firm on their position there. Um, so any questions on that item? Uh, uh, Councillor Mark. Um, yeah, one or two. <clears throat> oh, just on that item, on the ministerial meetings, is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, why is it now a good idea um, to uh, allocate a certain amount of affordability in the special housing areas when only Dave and I thought it was originally? Why is why that changed mind? Apart from the Kiwi build, why are we so enthusiastically embracing it? Because we put up 20, now that he's saying 40, and suddenly it's a good idea. What's changed? Because I'll do whatever I can to work with central government to achieve what the government of the day wants for this country. And the government of the day is trying to achieve um, uh, one of their 100-day policies, which is Kiwi Build. And they've specifically asked us and pointed out how they how we can help them to do that. And I'm very happy to make that work for them. Is, um, um, this, this government has a lot to offer back to this region and to this yeah. council. And um, if there's things we can do for them, I'm happy to uh, to get involved and help them achieve their the outcomes they're looking for. And can you, uh, the response from the developers when you had those conversations with them, how did that go? Very, very positive. They right. understood that's where this government is heading and wants to go. And um, they, the, I didn't, there was no pushback whatsoever. Okay. Um, regards to the, the fuel tax, I mean, that's pretty firm. It, did they hint that there may be any other way they could help us with their expensive <laughs> transport initiatives? Um, because Julian Genty yesterday was out there saying about alternative transport and they're going to fund everything. Did he hint at anything else that they could do to help us? Or is um, it all going to be on our rate payers? Well, we are having very <coughs> close talks with them over rail. And, mm. um, you know, that's, that is a transport initiative that, again, this government is a change of direction from the last government mm. where they see it as a very high priority to get a link going between Hamilton and Auckland. Yeah. And um, that that would be a great yeah. outcome for the city um, in partnership with or with central government. So but other than that, was there anything? Because I mean, the the fuel tax we were going to use for it wasn't for rail; it was for our local transport initiatives um, and transport corridors. Did they hint at any other 
any other ways they could possibly help in the future, or has that not been ha No, not they didn't, yet? but in saying this, I um, want to be very clear that our relationship with central government is very, it, very good, and, and there's not, um, they weren't doing it in, in a way to... Yeah. Um, to put down our council or to not be working closely with us. Mm. I, I believe the relationship's very good. Okay. It's just a policy decision that they've made. Cool, thank you. Yeah. They're also, just um, uh, Mr Mayor, they're also <coughs> talking about uh, close cl collaboration from an officer's point of view, just to make sure that um, we're providing input and, uh, to briefings to ministers and so forth. So if we come up with ideas, we can put it forward through the, the ministerial officers to um, bureaucrat to bureaucrat, mm. obviously. Um, and have legs in that respect as well. So whilst there wasn't any opportunities provided for alternative revenue sources, um, I don't think the door's closed if we come up with ideas to actually have that conversation with them. Yeah, and I appreciate, um, and I don't want to make this a discussion, I'm trying to keep it as a question, but I appreciate that yesterday Julianne Genta came out <clears throat> and said we will fund a lot of these initiatives, and that, those were pretty much her words. So maybe that conversation between them hadn't happened at that stage that you had those discussions. So, yeah, can you, can you please keep your eye on that? Yes, of course, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the... Sorry. Yeah. I'm surprised that we're only just finding out now that the government have closed the door on the petrol tax when you knew about this before Christmas, but are we, are we, have you ideas that we might lobby our local MPs? I mean, aren't, aren't our needs for, um, similar to Auckland? in the sense that uh, Auckland's getting a petrol tax for its transport needs. Uh, indeed, we had exactly the same rationale when that was discussed in our 10-year plan deliberations. Yes. So are we just going to sit there and not take... Are we going to take that as a final answer, that there's no fuel tax for, the, for Hamilton? Uh, it was... Um made quite clear by the Minister of Finance that they didn't want to uh, this going outside the premises of Auckland City and they were very firm about it. And they were or they were? They were very firm. In their, in their so response. what's the rationale for giving the petrol tax to Auckland and not and not to Hamilton when the needs are quite similar? Did, did he give any reasons or was it just a, an off-the-cuff no? Well, I... I would, I'm speculating that I presume if they go outside the Auckland region, they really probably have to give it to the whole country, and um, they just didn't. They just see Auckland. I, I'm speculating here. It's a different see country. Auckland they see <coughs> Auckland is a different country, do they? I, no, I, it, no, it, in terms of the explanation that was provided, was basically, and whilst we have issues, the quantum of issues that Auckland is experiencing, for example, the special housing area, not special housing area, the special purpose vehicle discussion. Um, when they originally released the HIF discussion, they decided not to include all of um, Auckland's HIF applications because of Auckland's balance sheet. It's the debt to revenue ratio is significant, um, far greater than ours. And so they were more openly looking at alternatives uh, to fund Auckland's challenges. Um, admittedly, we've got our own challenges and we're not gonna stop putting forward solutions to meet our challenges, but we do know that from the feedback we received from um, the finance minister that a fuel tax is not one of them. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, my comments around the garden place, Victoria on the River, uh, the Victoria on the River um, activation money, so I can hold that till you've spoken about it. We'll come back on the end of the line. Councillor Dove. Yes. Look, um, I actually happen to agree with Councillor Rob and Councillor Mark on the fuel tax. My take of the answer was the same as yours, except that I view that as an opening bid in a negotiation. Um, and I think that there is very good purpose served by us putting the case for, the, for a fuel tax because, principally because the amount to be collected in a fuel tax is approximately equal to the, our annual transport improvements budget. If we don't do those transport improvements, gridlock is going to descend on the city. It already is, but it's going to be a lot worse and a lot quicker. Um, I think that the, 
in a proportional sense, our our transport issues are very similar to Auckland's. Um, the quantum of the that you would collect from a fuel tax will help us alleviate them, or at least help hold the line. I think is more accurate. Um, I think by making the case for a fuel tax in Hamilton, uh, we can uh, highlight the need for additional revenue sources. It shouldn't be just up to us to find those extra revenue sources. The government has to also enable other finance vehicles in this area. Um, and I think the, I don't think the government is averse to us hearing us put a case for the fuel tax because of Hamilton's needs, and then we can enter negotiation. You know, if they have a better idea, they can tell us. If we have other alternatives, we can tell them as well. Um, there's, uh, some of the alternatives that have been suggested would be far harder than a fuel tax, such as returning GST, for instance, has been suggested, but that would actually be a lot more difficult for a government to do in the short run than, than enabling a fuel tax. Uh, I, I think we, we should not lose sight of the reasons <coughs> that we were proposing it. We, weren't, we didn't just see it as a nice to have, we saw it as essential that we got some outside revenue to support that. So my suggestion is that the, um, we ask the CEO and the general manager infrastructure to work up the arguments as to why we need that and uh, put that through, I guess, the growth and the, uh, infrastructure committee in the first instance so that we can put a case to government on, on, in this area. I think that the fuel tax is the quickest hook to enable that. So I'd like to see some sort of discussion. And I didn't see that the government is saying, don't come to us about a fuel tax. They said, you know, we, I heard from them, we don't favour a fuel tax. The other reason why Hamilton would be different from the rest of the country is that, well, Ham and more similar to Auckland, is we're the second fastest growing city in the country after Auckland. Um, so it's not like Omaru or... Um, to need, and need the transport improvements budget that we need. So there's a special reason why here in Auckland and perhaps Tauranga uh, do need that sort of vehicle for additional revenue. OK, so I'll suggest a motion uh, to the effect of that we instruct a chief executive to come through with a report for us, uh, for the um, uh, mayor to present back to central government um, w um, to continue to push for a, a fuel, to continue to discuss a fuel tax for Hamilton. Um, yeah, well, I'm happy to work on something while the, you're doing the other parts of your report, yeah. if that's all right. So if you um, work with the girls yeah. in a few seconds, that, that would be appreciated, Dave. Yeah. All right. We'll get that up now, just so we can finish with this item. Um, so we're still talking on the same item, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Martin. Um, obviously, I agree with that. I also think, and, and again, I'm open to um, <coughs> tactics, but we have a, the Waikato Mayor's Forum, we have the Waikato Plan talking about one voice, and I think that issue would be quite an um, important way just to, if in fact we do have one voice because one thing I notice when the question of regional development fund comes uh, and the media rang all the mayors it was kind of immediate uh, in my view a lot were just talking about their own patch with respect and I think also um, it's not just Auckland that's experiencing huge uh, pressures on transport infrastructure the UNISAR councils Northland, Whangarei uh, Hamilton, Tauranga, the, you know, this is the so-called golden growth uh, triangle. So when the uh, chief executive does his reports, I'd certainly like uh, us to consider uh, the, the, the one voice approach. And I, I would argue actually certainly Waikato uh, is not necessarily uh, different. The other issue too is I think philosophically um, a lot of, you know, our transport budget depends, if you like, to a great degree, not totally, obviously, uh, there's already a, a transit component on, on property tax, i.e. rates. The, the beauty, of course, of uh, fuel tax, and I'm beating my old horse again, 
is our lovely visitors from Tamahiri and others get to pay. Uh, and that's serious because, you know, people are using our roads. This is, and this is where, Gar and I better not mention Gary's name, but this is where um, a user pay, you know, this, and, and eventually uh, fuel tax will be car charging, electric, whatever it is. But it means that um, you have a situation where someone, an elderly person would live in a property, not do too much driving around, but um, other people who come and visit Hamilton uh, use all of our infrastructure, and I think that's just a good way um, to do it. So I'm going to totally uh, support that, and I think uh, if we can convince the government, uh, then we have to, as a city, really kick back at any politician who would have the temerity to accuse the government of just raising taxes for raising taxes. Uh, this is a much needed um, extra tax in my view. Uh, it's fairer, in my view, it's actually fairer because basically it's the user, the motorists, the people who drive around our roads get to pay, whereas you may have a number of property owners who don't necessarily drive around all the time and it certainly picks up, very importantly in my view, uh, visitors um, to Hamilton as well. So I'll certainly be strongly supporting uh, Dave's motion. Councillor Ange. Man, uh, Mayor Andrew, I will continue to stick to questions during question time. Uh, just on the ministerial meetings, um, my questions I'll direct to the General Manager of Growth, who is leaving us shortly for brighter fields. Um, Calvin, in light of the new target of the 40%, how many of our current, um, I think there's six applications in, are uh, anywhere near that threshold of 40% affordable houses, if any? Um, so we've contacted them all. They've all indicated that they, they believe they can make that. The difficulty at the moment, though, is that um, we need to get a conf confirmed policy position from central government on what the affordability target number is. So when the first discussions come out, they were talking around um, that affordability would be below 600,000 in metropolitan areas and below. So that on, on that measure, then they believe they could do that through basically having smaller footprint houses and uh, increasing their densities within the area. Um, but the final policy position on what that looks like is, is yet to be determined out of what the Kiwi Board policy is. Is the, is the Minister's office indicating at all that the criteria of affordability, which is 6.8 <coughs> times the median household income, which for Hamiltonians works out to, I think, a, a 67, uh, sorry, a, a house of around four, between 450 and 490,000. Yep. Is, is the Minister indicating at all that that 6.8 is like, that that calculation is likely to change? Oh, I'm, not, I'm, not aware, I'm not aware of what the final position will be. So that they've talked about, again, the only indication we've got was from the initial media comments for, and from our meetings where they were talking around the market affordability. Um, but your, your comment's a good one, and it's something that we could put forward as a suggestion of what availability is. Um, when you look at, so that's, that's just, but just to give you a feel for that, where there are, so for example, Andrew Yeoman doing developments where he's doing higher densities and smaller footprint townhouse duplex type developments, they are in that range that would be under that, that so that would fit. So in terms of is it feasible, yes, it could be feasible if they took that approach. And my last question, Calvin, so what are our next steps in terms of our policy? Will we go back now? Because I think that dra as the policy was being drafted, um, there was a 20% threshold put in there. That didn't make the final cut of the policy. So we've, what, what amount of work and what are the yep. next steps for us to uh, have another look at that policy? Yep. No. And if we do that, does that then, that would have to come back to council again? Correct. So. Uh, the, the, the concept that we put forward as staff um, that was taken out was around that very thing around small footprint buildings, that we would set a target of 20% around um, smaller footprint because we, we, as I pointed out, there is we believe there is a market in there that if we dictate that market at the lower smaller footprint buildings that you'll get to that affordability level and certainly the Yeoman developments would point to that and certainly the developments where our developers are developing are clearly in the four bedroom larger place because that's where the m margin is. So that makes sense. Um, so in terms of bringing that policy back to align with government when that is confirmed, we can bring that back at any time at the direction of council. We currently have those six applications which we'll be bringing back to council under the existing policy in March. And then if 
Council said that it wanted to revisit that to align with central government, then absolutely we can do that any time. So we're sort of we're okay at the moment until the government come back with their their hard and fast lines in the sand. This is what we yeah. it has to be included, and then we have to come go through the policy and go out to consultation again. So yeah. this will, in no. the long run, this will slow things down quite considerably. No, 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 no. I don't think we have to go back out to. Um, it's a policy of, of council, but at the moment, the the, the policy um, decision and, and the mayor has taken the. Uh, good advice to, to contact the developers, and they're saying, "Yep, we think that works off the Kiwi Build policy, and then we can do um, our work at any time to change that policy." Yep. Okay. So it, it shouldn't necessarily slow anything down. Okay. Thank you. That's all my questions on that one. So just to be clear, the government has asked us to meet a 40% threshold. This council signs off on SHAs, and so I would expect this council wouldn't sign off on anything with a threshold below 40%. And either way, the government has made it very clear that when it gets to their table, they get the final sign-off. Right. So why would we be... The, the, firstly, the developers won't put anything up because the government expectation is 40%. We won't sign it off. And even if we did sign it off, central government's unlikely to sign it off. So um, it, it's, it's very clear what we're saying is, this is these are the expectations. Don't bother coming forward unless you can meet the threshold that the signing authorities are, are requesting of us. So, so just for clarity, um, that was the confirmation we've been trying to get from government in their new process. So they've effectively said, carry on with what you're doing now under the current policy. If you can if you can get them to the affordability targets, that'd be great. Developers said, yes, we can. We've said we'd like them to do that. That's the whole basis. Going forward, the Mayor, you're absolutely right. Under the under a confirmed policy, and which we will align with government, then that will be exactly correct. So everything we're doing now is trying to move that way, uh, and, and we uh, recommend those developments to the Minister, and the Mayor is quite correct that he would th then has the right to sign those off on that recommendation. Yep. Uh, Councillor Siggy. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. I just looked at the Kiwi Build uh, Housing, and uh, I just wonder how much influence we've got. I mean, they're talking about affordability, and I, I looked at the houses, and. I, I'm just again shocked at um, well, at <laughs> um, it's just going to be how much influence can we have in saying what kind of houses can we have? They say healthy and all this, but really it's just yep. junk again, a cheap junk builds and. Um, um, yep. No, and, and hang on, I not, think you're sorry, just, I'm I, a bit extreme. I but think the know. members just answered our own question, so <laughs> you've asked the I'm, question and you said it's junk, so I think that pretty sorry. well. I, I think it's a rhetorical question, wasn't it? No, I, I just how much influence do we ha can we have on that to improve the Kiwi build? Yeah, so idea. Well, we, we can. I mean, any we can input to the minister as we have, and, and I think the mayor is, is suggesting that we are supportive of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the point that we're making is that when government have confirmed their poly position on what Kiwi build program look like looks like to to uh, Councillor Bunting and Tauliri, then we would align our policy to ensure that. And the methods we use, which I think is what you're asking around, is, is around the very thing about putting numbers around small footprint market availability to higher density levels to enable that. Um, and then the quality aspects could also be built in if we thought that that was something we wanted yeah, to do. But, it's the but those, are driven, about, those yeah. are driven through the building code as it stands now. Okay. Um, and, and it will, yeah, so yes, we can align to that and we can input, and as we are, and the Mayor is aligning with the, with the current Minister on that um, and, and is supportive of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mark. Thank you. Just um, very quickly, was there a discussion had with them with regards to the 40% threshold? Was that of each development or was that of the entire programme? No, you could you could average it, um, right. but yeah. I think that I wish uh, uh, my my take is, is that we put the responsibility back on each the SHA developer. that they'll deliver 40%. If right. we start, um, I, I, I don't like the idea of trying to average. And, yeah, well, um, I'm just thinking for you know we, we need to be prag well, pragmatic or sensible about it because you have the the one behind the Gallagher's the, the habitat one for example which is focused on affordability so then you can afford to have a couple of sort of more top end. Well, so, our that discussion had or? highest um, value SHA that's likely to come forward. Ha they have indicated that they can meet the threshold and that Great. they're comfortable with that. So um, the, cool. the 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 SHA that we're still waiting for, which is likely to to be the highest value um, SHA that's going to come forward, um, mm -hmm. they they're comfortable that they can deliver. 
Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll put this to the vote. Um, it's on the board. Um, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Dave. Is this the whole, is this the whole week? Uh, so it's, it's A that we're voting on. So all those four? A, yes. yes. Yep. Any against? Councillor Southgate and O'Leary against. Okay, so now we're moving on to the Central City Park. I'll take it as read. Um, it's moved by myself, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Rob. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, it, it surprises me that we, or I assume that we've tried to get business sponsorship for this. There are some, in my view, some very, very wealthy developers and some very successful businesses that all uh, close in and fit around Victoria on the river. And it just seems to me to be surprising that, apart from the generous uh, contribution by the developer, that we should be funding um, entertainment that will be specifically beneficial, or predominantly beneficial, to those businesses and to those developers. So have we tried to get some development? Have we tried to get some um, sponsorship from those businesses? Um, can I hand that question over to uh, GM? We're still in the process of doing that, so um, we put this together at reasonably short notice after the opening and discussion with uh, Mayor Andrew just about how we keep the place activated. So there's still some discussions happening with the, um, especially the neighbouring businesses and those people you talked about. Um, yep. So we're hoping to progress that uh, as soon as we can. Um, but this was basically, we want to get this on the table so that we, you know, we don't have to wait another month and actually get okay, some Okay, look, I, I support, I support the initiative. I just don't think, if, if we start off being the, um, the, the uh, promoter and the, and, and the um, financier for it, then it's unlikely that we'll get any support going forward. So I'd like to see that. And, and the feedback is that is that positive from uh, the from the businesses and the generally the, yes. I, th I think there's um, Tracy and I have been talking about that just about the the more long term. You know, obviously there's this summer, yep. and, and we sort of opened it halfway through the summer, and you know, in a heat wave. Yep. Um, but probably the conversations we're having about a more long term um, plan for that area too around. Uh, this type of act activation, and then can we get the uh, businesses, and if, and if other businesses open up onto that space, then we can actually talk to them as well about what happens next summer and, and those sorts of things okay. going forward. Okay. And one last question. Is Victoria on the River now called the Central City Park? I'm just a little bit confused that we've got a heading here, Central City Park, and then we're referring specifically to Victoria on the River. Um, I thought that that was its own development, and the Central City Park is one additional development that might um, uh, get approval once we sign off on the long-term plan. Um, uh, I wrote the report. I'm happy with what I've done. I call it Central City Park of development of Victoria on the River. It's very clear. So, okay. Well, okay. Councillor Ange. Um, thank you, Mayor Andrew. Uh, question to the CEO. The, um, the development or the completion of VOTR came in, I believe, around two months ahead of schedule, which is great. Does that mean that it came in under budget as well? I'll ask, um, I'll just pass it on to the GM. Uh, uh, we're just doing the final wash up, and obviously there's a, um, a defects period as well. Um, but we are within budget and we will come back with a more comprehensive report on uh, where we got to. I, I understand it's a little under budget, um, so, and I think uh, finishing early, um, we've probably been a bit lucky with weather as well, which uh, you probably recall we had a um, reasonable sum for contingency in there, uh, mainly on Chris's team's advice just around that sort of environment we're working in and I believe that we haven't had to um, dig into the contingency too much. So Lance, um, follow up question then. It'll be good news. It'll be good news. So this um, 22,000 could come out of that budget? 
Uh, my understanding it's a capital budget and this would be operational monies, but at the end of the day, it all goes into the same pot. A bit of a pot. wash up, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we'll 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 bring a um, final report about the whole construction side of the project um, back to council, um, and the next wee while we'll get Natasha to do that. Just once we've tidied up those loose ends, and then you'll have the full picture. But your intent is correct, councillor. Yeah. Um, just I, I suppose forewarning that that would be the only way that I would support this, and I think that's sensible. Um, Lance, who will manage the events and who will manage the budget if this is accepted? Uh, Tracy. Tracy. Okay. That that no, that's all I want. As long as it's 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 in house, that was all. Um, that's that's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Mark. Um, yeah, great. Look, great idea. <coughs> but wouldn't it be better in Garden Place, the uh, the movies? I mean. Uh, just looking at it originally, it just strikes me as, look, we've built this amazing facility, people are already going. Yeah. Um, the need is in Garden Place, and we've got the likes of, as you know, Nancy Cage and the Love the Tron movement who are doing some great activation work in there at the moment. Wouldn't it be better to spend that movie money in Garden Place where there's a facility already um, and leverage off the already, uh, all, the, all the great success we're getting already from Victoria on the River? Did you give any, or would you consider spreading that activation over those two areas? There's a natural wall in the theatre park which um, is facing west, so it breaks the prevailing winds that come that would sweep through that area. And that wall is already there, and that wall overlooks a grassed area where people could sit, and also a terraced area where people could see it. So it's a, it's a natural uh, theatre environment. Yeah, environment mm -hmm. there already. So that's what um, led to the, the thought that it would be a great place. And I've noticed that when I go down there sometimes, a couple of times a week in the evenings, that, that place up until 12 o'clock at night has couples sitting there holding hands, have people there sitting there having a smoke. There's um, people there playing on their phones, and it's just a really comfortable Right. Uh, environment where so, people so, are naturally going and naturally hanging out, and we just thought. So, following that, why would we put a movie in front of them? So, so we thought. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, no, yeah. I don't mean any disrespect. Yeah. I don't mean to be rude, but I'm thinking we're just a little, perhaps a little bit too late and to try hard with this. Uh, we've built a beautiful facility. The need is in Garden Place at the moment. Um, so, can we not leverage off that and perhaps gently start to bring people back to that area as well? So the, the concept was that um, <coughs> as the sun was going down in the late afternoon, we'd have a, a bit of a one-man band over in the far corner so that it wouldn't intrude on the people who were over on the other side of the park. Right. And then as the sun had gone down, that there would be a movie in the early evening where families or with kids or people could just come down, have a, a picnic going through or whatever they wanted, Duck Island's next door, buy an ice cream mm. for the family, sit down, watch a movie, and um, for the for the remaining month or yeah. two of the, of the summer. Okay. So it, it's just naturally set up for it. Um, All right. Okay. Thank you. No, yeah. I look, and like I said, I appreciate the intent. Um, I just think perhaps we could, mm. yeah, we could spread it a little bit more and make those two two areas um, more active for the same money, perhaps with an upward inflection to try and make it sound like a question. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Paula. Thank you. Long, questions along the same line. I'll probably say something in the deliberation, in the commentary as well. Um, my, my question was how much budget is presently provided for the summer and for Garden Place as well? How much budget is in there? Does somebody know? For activation of Garden Place? There is no budget. No budget for garden play, so this, okay. Uh, and where does this um, 19,000 come from? Where's it being reallocated from? Uh, it says in here risks and opportunities. It says it under bottom so it's line just of under, the and So it's already... So basically it's a, it will be a budget overage. It's not been reallocated from anywhere. And that was Councillor O'Leary's question about whether or not it could be funded out of any um, surplus from the construction of the of the site. Um, yeah, but it's an, over, it's an overrun budget. Yeah, yeah overrun budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, I noticed um, it's intended not just to be theatre, it's uh, uh, movies, is it? There's um, musical performances, 
and what did I read? A few things, musical performances and other things going on. Um, what impact do staff believe that would have on the musical performances that are occurring in Garden Place over the summer? I'm all for events, by the way, but it's, you know. Thank you. Good morning. Um, there are a number of activities already booked into Garden Place through our community use, yep. and um, this will be an activation for Victoria on the River to begin engaging with the community to encourage them to use the space going forward. So there is quite a lot of activity already booked into Garden Place for the months ahead, for the summer months, um, particularly community driven. So, but do you do you think that? Um, uh, look, I don't want to pick winners. Uh, I'd be nice if there were events all through town. Sure. But do you think there's the possibility with activating um, and, and Victoria and the River is already well used? It's lovely. Do you think there's the possibility of moving, like say, moving activation from there, from Garden Place? In fact, you know. Uh, having a negative impact on Garden Place? I don't believe so. I think they are very um, different spaces. They're very complementary to each other, and I think the usage of those areas is distinctly different given their, their layout and their geography and the way that they work. So I see them being very complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Councillor Jeff. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, look, my question's quite similar to the last two speakers, but I'll ask it in a different way. Um, I, I'm just confused. I like the intent. I'm loving Victoria on the River. I'm really proud of it. I think it's fantastic. I'm just confused because it just seems to me that activity in that space is going to happen organically anyway, or already is happening organically anyway. Why are we even needing to create more activity there, I suppose? It's near the water. It's going to be a winner. Uh, that's the difference between it and Garden Place. Yeah. So I guess for me, I'm just... I'm, Supportive of it. I'm similar to Councillor O'Leary. I think I'd only support it if, I, if the money was coming from somewhere else. Um, can you just sort of exp explain why we need to... Why won't it just happen? It's happening organically now. Why do we need to push it? I, if, if I may, um, I think it's an opportunity to begin the activation. I think with any new space... But it's begun. It, it's begun, but I think the opportunities are immense. And so what we want to do, I guess, is showcase the opportunities, which then encourages our community, organisers and activities, to take advantage of that. But haven't they already been encouraged? Aren't they already there? I, not yet. Not yet. I think they are there as individuals enjoying the space, but I don't think yet we're seeing our event organisers um, and, and community groups seeing the opportunities that exist. So I think this is the beginning um, of of that activation process. Just a follow-up question. Is, is some of this equipment, and that this is for ongoing use, is that right? Yes, it's not it just for a one-off sort of That's summer? That's correct. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll go to the vote. All those four. Oh, we cancel Ange. Discussion? Yep. Discussion? Debate? Your Honour, yep. Councillor. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, Look, I, I want to acknowledge the support for activation because it has been a really long time since we've had a proper activation program. However, I don't think that we are the best people to do that. Um, I have always been very supportive of and lobbied several times over many years for the association, the Hamilton Central Business Association, to be able to come and present an activation and events program and plan to us. I think that they could leverage outside sponsorship and do a whole lot more um, they have over 1,200 members. They could have corporate sponsorship and all sorts of things. I don't think we are, we are in the right place to do it. So I know that the general manager of the association is putting together a program um, and going to present it in submission. So I acknowledge, and I'm a big supporter of activation, but we have done it a, a little bit here and a little bit there in the past with some success and some failures. Um, I want to see the association and I want this council to have an open mind and look at what that program of activation is going to look like. I do have a, a concern with us consistently dipping into risks and opportunities. It's not a budget of invisible money for us. It is there and should be treated uh, uh, under emergency things, um, unforeseen things, 
and not just for a small events program. I don't think 22,000 would really be uh, able to deliver, if we've got another two to three months of fine weather ahead, really to, to deliver anything um, substantial. I do think that the community and Councillor Bunting, I, uh, or Councillor Taylor mentioned, Nancy Cager and other members from the community, they're able to get in there and do things now. You know, they put in the little library, um, uh, Tai Chi's happening, there's all sorts of things. So there's nothing stopping people doing that. But if we're going to do activation, it needs to be done properly, and I don't think we're the ones to do it. So for those reasons, <coughs> I won't be supporting this particular motion at this time. Councillor Jones. The yeah, same, same, but different for me. Look, uh, we, it's, it, Victoria and the River is a fantastic place. Went down there for the opening, and it is really fantastic. But do we need to do more there? I think um, Hamilton City Council should be an enabler, but we shouldn't be a funder for public entertainment. Now it goes away from our core business, really. And, it's, and when you look at it, it's almost twenty thousand dollars for one and a half months entertainment. Um, and like previous councillors uh, have said, that uh, Nancy Cager is um, activating Garden Place at the moment. If we're going to do any sort of entertainment stuff, it should be in Garden Place, but we should not be the funder. We should just be the enabler. Um, so I can't vote for um, $19,200 for a one and a half month period. Councillor Paula. Thank you. I, I don't want to be bar humbug about um, city events because I do think, I do honestly believe that small events do encourage people to participate in city life and that adds that adds to our quality of life as a city. So I do like those. What concerned me about this was the um, um, potential effects, though I am somewhat satisfied by the, the response I got on Garden Place and, and the equity between the money that might be spent in Garden Place. I wasn't, while I was, I was happy with your response to the effect it might have, I was less happy to learn that there isn't um, money going into um, garden place events also so you know it does leave it up to the public to kind of to generate opportunities um, and uh, and look I'd like us to um, reopen the conversation at, at a level at, at a level above this about what we do to support small events what the criteria I know this is going back in time in a way because we've gone away from that but I think we need to know what are the sort of criteria and we need to um, assess those opportunities so we get the best bang for the buck. Where should it be? What kind of event is going to bring us success for that money? And we haven't had any of that thinking, unfortunately. Um, but look, you know, uh, I probably will vote for this because it's a small amount of money, although I absolutely um, uh, agree with Angela. We can't just be chipping away at small amounts of money ad hoc. That's not quite right. But I do think that the Hamilton public would, um, if we were in partnership, and I'd like to see some private public partnership around these events, I'd like to see that happen. I think it is fair to, um, to build on, a, on what has been a good success, Victoria on the River, and bring some people there. Um, I'm not totally happy about the types of activities that are um, proposed because some of those already do happen in Garden Place. Sorry, I've nearly finished. For example, the large outdoor games. You, you know, we we just don't want to replicate what's in Garden Place somewhere else, so that becomes the preferred place for large outdoor games. So I'd like that content. The theatre, maybe the movie theatre uh, screen, maybe so. But some of the other stuff that's already happening in Garden Place. Let's not undermine Garden Place by doing the same thing in the other space. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'll be supporting this motion. Uh, this builds on the previous Mayor, Julie Hardacre's strong support for central city transformation. And to affect that, there's a whole mix of tools you use. Some of that is obviously major capital works and construction. Some of that is getting alongside local business people, association and the community. Uh, this, in my view, also is celebrating the river plan in that this is a spectacular viewpoint from the CBD. It gives us both central city transformation and a river plan in terms of taking the opportunity we have for the remainder of the summer months, a particularly good summer in my view, um, to 
do what we can to continue to um, revitalise and vitalise the CBD. We've had a lot of, um, in my view, um, negativity over the years around the CBD. What we are now seeing is some very exciting developments in terms of the private sector, the, some of the building, the, some of the restoration that's going along. So I will be supporting this because this is totally consistent with the previous mayor and council in reactivating our central city and promoting the river plan. Councillor Mark. Uh, thank you, Mayor Andrew, and thank you for putting this up. I think, I think it is a great idea. I just don't think it's quite cooked yet. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I'm worried about Garden Place becoming the poor cousin of this beautiful facility. It is a magnificent facility. Heaven knows it's had more publicity than anything we've done, apart from the balustrade in, uh, in Hamilton. And it's been, and, but this has been great publicity. It's been on all of our Facebook pages. It's been all over the, the media. It's been fantastic. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's going to generate crowds. Building it generates the crowds. The crowds are there already. Um, it's a bit like suddenly Dad turning up at the party and dancing for entertainment um, to me in that, you know, it, it's already there. People are already holding hands, like you said. Um, they're already walking down. They're already having a beautiful time. I think um, the wise thing to do would be to yes. spread the activation over not only Garden Place but also Civic Square. Uh, what I would like to see is movies in Garden Place, because we've tried them, they worked um, for many times, but we've ripped the budget away from that. Um, I think we should be leveraging off that then spreading it over to Civic Square and putting out the garden furniture during the day and you know for people to sit and putting music up there. But I think this needs to be a, a bigger program. I endorse the comments of the Deputy Mayor, but I think we need to think a little bit more holistically rather than just in isolation. So I won't be supporting it just yet, but I'll be very, very keen to work with the Mayor or with anybody who's keen to look at an activation program for the Central City. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank um, Nancy and her group for the work they're doing. Um, in the pretty much use it or lose it campaign with, with Garden Place. They're doing some great work there. And that's the way we should be uh, working as a council, working with these people who want to do this, who drive it, and supporting their initiatives rather than saying, no, we'll, we're the only ones who have initiatives. So um, almost there, and I'll support it when it is, but not at this stage. Councillor Jeff. Thanks, Mayor Andrew. I think Councillor Bunting has framed very nicely of my thoughts too. and. and uh, and I'll be going along the same lines there. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity quickly to congratulate uh, the designers, builders, the council staff, um, everyone behind the Victoria on the River project. And we've had, you know, every council talks about the legacy from the last council, and there's been criticism financially about some aspects of it. But hey, last council came up with us, well done. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm very proud to inherit it. Um, I. I went down there on Waitangi Day because I was overseas um, cruising around Australia during the opening and I just looked at uh, the people there. Uh, they were very animated, excited um, and it made me proud um, to be a Hamiltonian. I, and I think, um, I think actually that um, the opening of Victoria on the River will actually be the making of the Central City Park because people can now see the possibilities um, of what you can do if you get a few properties alongside it and open up more of Victoria Street to the river. So I think we're on a really exciting path there. Uh, in terms of this particular thing, I just don't, I'm just not right with this. I don't think it's entirely necessary and I think it's 20 grand that we don't need to spend right now. Councillor Leo. I was down here on Sunday and one thing which did concern me of course a little bit was there was a number of kids on these BMX bikes who were uh, doing wheelies all over the place and jumping up and down the ramps and uh, over the walls and all those sort of things. Um, one thing which does concern me, of course, is uh, from the opening, we've got about eight weeks until the 1st of April when the uh, daylight saving finishes. When I look at what the musical performance is costing us, and uh, I don't know whether it's just the same guy who was there on the opening night, is he? So, different guy? Oh, variety. Okay. We're actually paying them uh, $227 an hour to actually sing it. And uh, there's a lot of buskers around the place. I think they would be quite happy to go down there and throw their hat out and probably do it for free. Um, yeah, my, my concern is, of course, is we don't want this area to become a, an area which is a a playground, shall we say, for the skateboarders and the BMX bikes and the uh, wheel standers and all these guys who are doing it. 
It reminds me very much of the Bowl of Brooklyn, to tell you the truth, in New Plymouth. And I can envisage that uh, the seating around there and uh, performance down on the lower level would really attract a lot of people. And would that have cost us anything? Maybe an admission to a, uh, a concert or something like that would be a far better way to go. So I will actually be voting against the proposal. OK, I'll speak to this um, as a mover of the motion. Uh, firstly, I just want to point out that we do have an events coordinator that works for council who does a very good job and coordinates and organises our events, and that's exactly what she's here for, and that's what the proposal is, is that she organises events in our premium facility. Um, I celebrated Waitangi Day in Taupo. Um, it was set up on the edge of the river because that was their premium waterfront position to have an event. Uh, when they have their summer com um, concert in Taupo, where is it? It's on the edge of the river. When um, you go to Auckland, we get in our cars. We don't drive up to Auckland to go to Albert Park. We park our cars up, we walk down to the waterfront. What's happening on the waterfront? There's buskers there that are actually paid by the council to do what they're doing. Yeah, they've got a hat out, but they're also paid by the council to do it. And some of them are brought in from overseas and they do it on a grand scale and they have hundreds of people standing around in their premium facility watching <clears throat> what happens when the America's Cup's on, what happens when there's a big rugby game on, Auckland Council will put it up on the big screen. Where do they do it? Not in Albert Park, not even in the Auckland domain, because they're not their premium facilities. People want to be by the water. They do it down on the waterfront. When you go uh, down to um, New Plymouth, where, where do their events happen? The council pays for and puts on events down on their waterfront because that's their premium facility. They've got lovely other parks in the city, but they use their premium facility down on the waterfront. And, and that's what this proposal is. Do people really want to come into town and sit in Garden Place on an evening while the sun's going down? Or do they want to sit at our premium facility on the water for their event, where they're out of the wind but the sun's going down, the river's going past, and they're eating a Duck Island ice cream from the, 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 from the arcade next door. <laughs> so um, th this is about actually activating something for our central city. And that's what the concept is, is to bring people in here and to have people enjoy the city. And our job as a council is to put money up for all the people in our city who have families who can't necessarily afford to pay to go to an event, to go to entertainment, but can come down, bring down a rug, spread it out on the grass, have a duck island ice cream, bring down some sandwiches, and enjoy what this council has prepared to put $20,000 up for to activate our city centre up until daylight savings finishes. We'll go to the vote. The motion is lost. Eight against, four, four. OK, we'll move now to... Um, to the next motion, which is the Deputy Chair for Community and Services. So that's on page 20, uh, 82, moved by Councillor Gary, seconded by Councillor Rob. Uh, all those for, any against, carried. Okay, we now move. The next one, schedule of reports. So where are we now? We're doing the appointment uh, of the committees. So we can get this voter on that, haven't we? Hey, uh, Councillor Rob. Oh, yeah, my question is on the schedule of reports. Yes. Um, not on the next one, which is... OK. So um, we're on to appointments to other committees. Do we have a mover? Councillor Gary, seconded by Councillor Rob. All those for? Any against? Carried. 
Okay, uh, schedule of reports, uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Look, I've just got a query on why there are so many uh, gaps um, in the uh, reports over the next 12 months when I note that the um, REAP is required under its terms of reference to, to report six monthly. Um, there's no suggestion of reporting on the petrol tax, which um, we've discussed already this morning, but we may want to continue that discussion going forward, particularly in respect to progress that might need to be made in line with the um, long-term plan. Also, we've got no suggested reporting dates for the Housing Infrastructure Fund. I mean, those are examples. There are other gaps around the MEF, um, the Vibrant Trust and so forth. And I, I just wonder if we're starting the year off, we should perhaps have some indicative uh, uh, council meetings where these reports are scheduled to appear so that at least we don't lose um, um, sight or momentum that seems to be necessary. And, uh, and, and I mean, if a, a report is not required or is not able to be presented at a particular meeting, then of course it will be brought to our attention and, and the revised date um, will be then notified. Uh, if, if I may um, respond, Councillor Pascoe, uh, you're absolutely right. The purpose of the schedule is to provide elected members with visibility about upcoming work. Um, and we're happy, uh, subject to the Chair's uh, agreement, to incorporate anything. In terms of some of the specific things you mentioned, um, for example, REAP at the moment is scheduled to end at the end of this financial year, subject to the outcome of the 10-year plan discussion. And the petrol tax, of course, at the time of writing, um, we had no indication of how that might be reported. So there are certainly things that, if they're topical um, and councillors want us to add them into the schedule, we will. With the HIF and the MEF, the principle we've taken uh, is that they get reported through the other co committees of the whole and then come to council. So and they are lumped up in these uh, reports from from the other committees of council that come forward, which is logical, but doesn't provide the visibility that you're looking at. So it may well be the case that when we've done the schedule of um, report, the work schedule for those other committees, that we then populate the council work programme to reflect the subsequent airing of the reports that have gone to community and services or growth and infrastructure or finance, if that's the case. Uh, but absolutely happy to take feedback from elected members. That's why this is here, if you think that there's something that should be explicitly there. I, I guess if you're confident that certain matters won't sit on the table and not come here because there's no particular meeting scheduled, um, then I'm quite comfortable with the way that you've just described things. I mean, my concern is that if there isn't a, a target date for a report, um, then it's possible, given the size of the organisation, that it, that it may just uh, continue on until yeah. somebody, and maybe it's one of us, uh, reminds council that we haven't had a report from a particular task force or group um, which we are supposed to have received. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to claim that any system we have is completely foolproof, but um, I will... Um, reassure councillors that of course we have the resolution spreadsheet as well so every decision of council this triennium is captured in a spreadsheet and it is that spreadsheet that we use to populate these uh, okay. charts and I take uh, and the principal advisors for the committees take responsibility for ensuring that any resolution of council that's on that spreadsheet um, does translate into a work program and a meeting agenda. Okay, I accept your explanation and happy with that. Can I just yeah. ask a question about the REAP? You mentioned that it was supposed, uh, the REAP is scheduled to end at the end of this year. My understanding is that the terms of reference provided for a two year budget and that we have approved um, the REAP and the um, and the budget, not only for the 18 year, but also for the 19 year. 
you are correct. Yeah, I okay. stand corrected, sorry. So, so we really should, at least at looking at the REAP anyway, yes. we should have a date in six months' time, given its terms of reference, that it should be scheduled to report, even if um, it subsequently defers that report because there's nothing to report on that yep. particular date. Yep. No, quite correct. Yep. We, okay. should, we should. We'll add that in. So can you add that in? Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Councillor Ange. Thank you, Matt. Andrew. Um, Leanne, the, uh, uh, under strategic reports, the, uh, the second one down, the outcome uh, of consultation for the founders, uh, that's a resolution that's on the books for the 30th of March. Is that, are you indicating here that that may change since it's not highlighted for that? Or is that we've just missed it off the I list? I think it's quite possible that we've missed it. Uh, it also, of course, will come up through the tenure plan meetings as well, but that specific regulation, yeah, we'll yeah. add it in. Okay. Um, second one is um, Mia Andrew, you're going through your uh, governance structure. I see there that's uh, reported, going to be reported here to August. Um, further down under submission and legislative reports, it says that the electoral representation review, including um, Māori representation, is coming to us in May. Or perhaps, sorry, if this may be a question still to you. Does that all align? Does that align correctly with uh, the mayor's review, or is that is that earlier for a reason? I thought that those two might coincide. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my thinking there is that we, we do have a date for the representation review, so we do need to bring that back to, to Council by the 24th of May, and we have previously undertaken to resolve Māori representation, the tasks that you gave us at that same time. I suspect that having a Council decision in May about Māori representation will inform uh, the, the mid-term review that Mayor Andrew's talking about. Great, that's the confirmation I was looking for. Um, question, just, I'm assuming it's just a heading, but stakeholder liaison reports, there's a whole lot of dates there, so what are those ones about? I haven't really seen those that wording before. Uh, I think it's a heading we've had on other, okay. um, but typically those reports go to the committees of the whole. So that would be things like um, uh, HCBA. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so airport, sort of some of the CCA. annual reports, half yearly reports, those kinds that's of things. That's correct. Okay. Um, that's all my questions. Thank you. Councillor Paula. Um, Leanne's right that the schedule of reports for other committees is not far behind. I just wondered if it would be useful at that time to combine put all of the schedules of reports together, getting this one and then the other one and then the other one so that we have a, a one place record of all of the, all of the. Yeah, so that is on OneDrive, Councillor Southgate, where they are, and we keep them updated if there's any okay. changes there as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do we have a mover? Councillor Mark, uh, Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Ange, all those four, any against, carried. Okay, so now we go on to the verbal reports. Um, I'm proposing to establish a short-term review panel for the development contributions policy. This policy is required urgently to staff um, to address um, elected member feedback on proposed changes of the development contributions policy. The membership of the pa panel is proposed to be Councillor Pascoe, Councillor Mallett, Councillor McPherson and myself. The, pa the panel will um, um, will be complete its work within three months, but it is actually proposed that this um, could be quite a lot quicker. Um, so the recommendation is that the council approves the establishment of a DC review panel for the period of three months and appoints Mayor Andrew, councillors Pasco, Mallet, and McPherson to the panel to work with staff and to bring recommendations back to council for consideration. So um, I'll move that. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Mark, all those four? Any against? Carried. Um, so the uh, next part of this verbal was, um, I'm pleased to advise elected members that conditional on council approving Peacock as a growth cell at the next long-term plan 
ministers in Wellington have provisionally approved the HIF funding. Uh, so that's the 272 million um, made up of some of that's made up of um, NZTA. NZTA. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as <laughs> as mayor, I'm very grateful to the. So as mayor, I'm very grateful to this new government for an, enabling our future housing supply. Um, staff will work closely with the central government on the details of the funding agreements and draw up time frames and keep our elected members informed uh, once the 10-year plan is completed. And then, yes. Are you proposing uh, to bring this matter of Peacock back to council prior to us, um, prior to us uh, uh, continuing with the consultation <clears throat> on the 10-year plan so that a decision may be made um, prior to the 10-year plan being concluded on Peacock? No, the two go hand in hand, but I will run that past the chief executive, but my understanding is it's out to public consultation now. It'll come back, go through deliberations and get signed off with the 10-year plan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Mark. Yeah, um, when we were last discussing it, uh, I think the chief executive and Calvin were talking about uh, we're constantly looking for a better deal. Um, how has that gone or have they stopped or is, how's that going? Um, we're constantly looking uh, for it. We, we have been constantly looking for a better deal. Um, the terms and conditions of the agreement are still being... Did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yes, we have been. So the, the SPV work, or Special Purpose Vehicle yep. through the Crown Infrastructure Partners has still been looked at. Yep. We, uh, uh, Blair and I met with um, uh, several key bureaucrats from MB, Treasury, DIA, and Ministry of Environment to look at how um, Housing Commission and, and the government's approach to Housing Commission might also assist that. Yep. So all of those are still in play yep. and the aim uh, to try and continue <coughs> to bring that into the fold and as the Mayor's quite rightly outlined, if, if Council adopts the LTP with Peacocks, the HIF is just a loan component of that and then a better deal ideally within that of the okay. items we're working on alongside. In, any discussion with um, LTNZ on the, the subsidy level of the bridge? <coughs> Pardon me? Any discussion with the uh, um, transport authorities on the uh, the level of subsidy on the bridge? Any pushback on no, that? No, no, no. So as, as, it's, um, as per the business plan, um, and as 50. the mayor's um, just notified you that the ministers have signed off on that on that deal as it's been there through the um, briefings, yeah. and then it's uh, the drawdowns and the time frames of that will work out okay. between now and July. Thank you. Okay, so at, at what point in time do you think we will know what the terms of the offer from government is in terms of you know the formal yep. which which mm -hmm. deals with SPVs and all the other things. Sure. Well we know that before the yes. long term plan deliberations. So that, so are, that is the intention um, to uh, during the deliberations. So they're working on that stuff now. Blair is working on that on our behalf. Um, but the intention is that we'll have that information to you during the deliberation period. The HIF, um, uh, remember the HIF is just the tool to fund the decision you make, remember it's Peacocks or Rotokauri. Um, but yes, I understand the point you're making, that you need to understand the drawdown periods what and the timeframes, and that, yeah. that, will, that, is, that is part of the, of the um, work we're doing now with central government to put that in place, remembering that we're the first council to go down this process. Yeah. So, so, so if you had two quotes to your question, Councillor Rob, the, uh, a part about SPV, so that process will not probably be completed by the time the 10-year plan is finalised. So, so when we go out for deliberations now on what we know, mm -hmm. we're assuming that this is going to be a loan from the government. That's correct. The, the details of which will appear on our balance sheet and affect our, our, our gearing ratio. But yes, it will be recorded as debt and will contribute towards our debt to revenue ratio. That's correct. Yeah, OK. okay. And so that's what we will go out and deliberate on. Yes, uh, and we won't know whether there's a kind of a better deal in terms of our balance sheet until yep. perhaps after the deliberations or after we might have approved the loan? 
we the, might have approved we, 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 acceptance of the, the loan. The best available information we have is the Housing Infrastructure Fund, and um, that's what we premised. And all the um, the 6th of December through to the 14th of December council meetings was premised on a Housing Infrastructure yep. Fund for Peacock as a way of funding that. So that's effectively how we're going forward. If we get a better deal, and um, so the question is whether or not we want to progress with Peacock, then the, then the question is from a debt to revenue point of view whether or not that's a satisfactory debt encumbrance. So yep. we've got to make sure we don't mix the two together. One, you know, one's funding the other, but the underlying premise is about fun is about growth. The second premise is about how do we fund growth. Yeah, the, you mentioned earlier in the meeting, or I'm not sure whether you did or Calvin did, that better deals are being offered to Auckland by central government, not only around the petrol tax, but also around the how how the funding that they're getting from central government will affect their balance sheet. Um, are we likely to have the same closed door approach that we've got on the petrol tax so far uh, from central government um, and, and perhaps the better deals ending up with Auckland in terms of how they're able to structure their loans? I, I actually I don't think so at this stage. Um, I think with... Um uh, Auckland's got a, a, a far different um, balance sheet structure than we do. The debt to revenue ratio is um, uh, a lot different to ours. They have a lot more concessions because of their credit rating in terms of what they do. Yeah, revenue I un under yep, understand yep. that, but th yep, yep. A, it's going to yeah, get oh, worse, won't it? Yeah, that, with, that, that, with, that's with correct. A HIF and, loan, uh, and so they could not sustain um, a significant HIF loan with it being on balance sheet, which was the catalyst for the government to look at alternative funding vehicles. And the term special purpose vehicle has been floated around number of times. Because of that and the amount of money that's been invested by Auckland Council in partnership with central government, they've come up with a number of options. And now we are engaging with um, central government as well as um, uh, Crown Infrastructure Partners, who are going to be the vehicle the government's going to use to actually make sure that we're involved in those conversations. So I've already had numerous conversations pre-Christmas. Blair's had a number of conversations. And Blair and I are going to um, meet with Tarot and Queenstown, Auckland this month. Um, oh, next Friday, sorry, next Friday to further those discussions. And so the model they've come up with will equally work for Auckland as it would for a development in Hamilton, Tarong or Queenstown. Is it fair to say, though, that our balance sheet would also be under pressure if we weren't increasing our rates by um, 18 or 19 per cent over the next year or two years? Yep, so... Uh, so we would have the same issues as Auckland if we weren't increasing our yes, rates so by the significant right. amount that we are? Oh, well, they're already above the 250. Yep, so... Um, the Auckland's debt to revenue ratio is already up to about 270%. Yeah. It's already blown all parameters of what's accepted. I, I, understand, I understand that, Mayor Andrew. I'm just looking at it yep, from so our, our perspective and the possibility that the government yes. is viewing Auckland as being quite different to Hamilton Oh, well, they certainly are as far as the fuel tax is concerned, yep. and whether they might do the same with any concessions that they might offer us around how the HIF loan is actually structured. Yep, so the, the HIF loan and the special purpose vehicles are, are two different um, processes that are travelling. They're, they're achieving similar outcomes, but there's different teams working on both of them because mm -hmm. the HIF process is here and now, and that process started two years ago and basically the journey's been led um, down that track. The special purpose vehicle aspect has now been given to Crown Infrastructure Partners to pick up and run with, and they're building their model around that. Um, the, the, the government's been very open, and this came from the Minister as well, that they're looking for a solution for funding of infrastructure in New Zealand. They want a New Zealand-wide infrastructure solution, because it's not only growth councils that have challenges, like we need to build a wastewater treatment plant because we're growing. Well, you've got a declining population that can't afford to build a new wastewater treatment plant when it runs out of um, guts, so um, literally runs out of guts. Um, so um, how do they manage that challenge? So the government knows there's a solution required here. The government knows there's some private sector individuals that wish to invest in this infrastructure because they see it as long-term sustainable returns or um, a little bit lower risk returns, but they want to make sure they do it right. So current infrastructure partners pick that up. They made it really clear that they work with Auckland because they had the... Um, uh, staff, the resource and the budgets to actually co-fund it, but they made it very clear, and Auckland made it very clear, they were more than willing to share what they find and involve with us. And we've offered ourselves as guinea pigs, subject to this council approval of course, um, for potentially trialling out some of these options. If they want to test something on a smaller, bu smaller basis, we have a number of developments that we can work with the government on in terms of doing this, and probably some willing investment partners as well. 
to do so as well. So we're doing everything we can, and they've been really favourable in hearing that message from us. So, and that's not just at a um, ministerial level, that's at the Crown Infrastructure Partners level, at the Treasury level, and at um, MB level as well. So I think we've done a good job setting it up. The proof is in the pudding, Councillor Pascoe. Once we get an offer and bring it back to the Council, if it actually stacks up and ticks those boxes, because you don't... You know, you don't know what you're going to get until you get the deal, and you go through, which is the question you were asking before about the HIF. When do you get to see the, the ink on the paper and make sure it actually meets our expectations? Mm -hmm. But we're quite hopeful. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just um, want to talk to this item. When the new government first got in, we, Richard and myself, uh, went to an event where the ministers were there, and we um, targeted full Twyford, and he made it very clear that he wasn't going to stand in the way of this HIF and he's been true to his word with the sign-off of this HIF now. So he, um, his, um, they, this government wants the same outcomes as what this council wants and that's more housing and an increase in housing supply and to keep ahead of the market. And um, both Robinson and Twyford, who we've met with now several times, um, really are doing everything they can for this council to do the best they can when you look at it through the lenses that they use, which are what's best for the whole country. And I have full faith in this government and, and the partnership that they have with this council and the close relationship that we've already built with them and the ministers making themselves available to, to us to, to discuss and to talk and to actually bring things through for the benefit of this city, which we normally wouldn't get if we didn't have relationship. It's all about relationship and trust. Um, I just also want to thank this council for continuing to go ahead with this HIF at this stage, and um, this, this is something that's happened under this council's watch. This is something that this council can actually legitimately say that we have achieved. Um, to, to this point, we haven't we haven't made the final decision yet, but there is um, 70 million dollars of direct benefit to our city by going with Peacock through this of central government um, money directly into this city, and um, that's that's a huge amount of money to help us to open up and an annex growth cell, and from what I know, that's never happened in, in recent history anywhere else until until this has come through. Um, the, the whole HIF fund was a billion dollars and we got nearly a third of that. So it's, um, it's certainly favour on this town from central government. And I just want to acknowledge both central government and yourselves and the staff who've done a lot of work on this to bring us this far. Okay, so we now move to see. So I'm proposing counselling, counselling committee meetings, council, thank you, and um, elected member briefings for the month of July. Sorry, have you got on the board? Yeah, sorry, we just there was no vote on the last item. No, no, no sorry. that's fine. Okay. Just... Um, for the month of July, to enable a mid-year recess for elected members and staff following the intense meeting cycle that we have um, engaged with the consultation on 2018-2020 18-year plan. I have dis discussed this already with councillors with the indication of support from all members. This will mean that the finance, the growth and infrastructure and the committee and services meeting and the elected member briefing for July will all be cancelled. There is no intention to reschedule these meetings. Committee meetings and briefings would resume from the week beginning the 30th of July as per the meeting schedule um, that the council approved last year. So the recommendation is that the council approve the cancellation of the Finance Committee, the Growth and Infrastructure Committee and the Community and Services Committee meeting and the elected member briefing that is scheduled between the 2nd of July and the 29th of July, inclusive 2018. So I'll move, um, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, all those for, any against? Carried. Okay, now move to move into public excluded. Uh, do we have a mover to Councillor James, seconded by myself, all those for, any against, carried. 